Today, the first one, we'll stay on the D2 level of talking to Ian. We're going to go Pittsburgh State. Division two out of the MIAA, the Gorillas. They were ranked, they came in at number four in the College Football Network's top 25 rankings. And I think any reputable ranking would put them at least in the top five, if not more, because this team has proven in the last however many years that they are going to be a premier team um, in, on this level of football. Last year, 12-1, and one, their one loss coming at number five, Ferris State, that being in the second round of the NCAA Division II playoffs. They gave them a game. They lose 14-17 to 17 to Ferris, probably the best game, well, For sure. second best game they got all year after Grand Valley did uh, yeah. actually it, beat if them. If I remember right, I don't remember. It came down to a field, obviously it was 14-17, to 17, but like, the end of the game, I can't remember if it was Pittsburgh State had to make a really long field goal and they missed, or like I can't remember exactly what happened, but it came right down to like the very last second of the game. Whatever, either Ferris made a field goal or Pittsburgh yes. State might so have it, missed one. But says, at the end of like yeah, uh, yeah, it says right here on the recap, Pitt State had a final chance to win or tie uh, the score in the game's final minute. They drove fifty six yards to Ferris State's fourteen yard line, but a three yard loss in a holding penalty forced them to try a 44-yard field goal to force yeah. overtime, and they did not get that. Imagine that, dude. Damn, what the hell? I knew a three-yard like loss that. and a holding penalty back like on the same play, and all of a sudden you go from we're on the 14-yard line, a chip shot, to then you're back three, and then back another five, and now all of a sudden that chip shot turns into a 44-yard field goal, and that is not a gimme, especially in Big Rapids. That's why you don't hold. <laughs> that's, that's why you don't hold. Um, but some statement wins for them last year. The first round of the playoffs was against number 13, Indianapolis, 35 to nothing. But Holy as, shit. As we've talked about a little bit, though, Indy last year, and I'm not, we don't usually come on here to throw shade, but as far as national rankings go, the Greyhounds were a little bit of a fraudulent Frauds. national rank. <laughs> yes. Uh, from an outsider's perspective, right? We didn't yeah. play them. We have not seen these guys play in person. But right. when you go into Saginaw Valley, who's unranked at the time, and you get throttled yeah, that was... when you're the number eight I team mean, in we're, the country. We are all like, like, what the? You know what I, I mean? remember, like, checking that. What it was the, the same beep? time we played. I swear it was when we were at Tech. No, it was, it was, uh... I think it was Tech. Couple other notable games for so. them last year, though. For Pittsburgh mind. State, uh, week two was at number eleven, Nebraska Kearney, who's also in the MIAA, and they beat them thirty-five twenty-eight. Come out with a one-score touchdown at their place. That was big time. Uh, then again, at Emporia State, another team who's ranked very highly in the preseason rankings, top twenty, and they beat them fourteen to thirteen. So I think a big part of this Pittsburgh State team that you'll see is that they are experienced enough and talented enough. More importantly, I guess that they are going to come out on top in these very close ones. And finally, the other top dog in that conference, <laughs> number nine, Northwest Missouri, when they played them in uh, week, looks like week six, week seven, 24-22. They went by two points at home. And it just felt like every week, at least looking at these scores, man, that these games came down to the wire, but every single time, Gorillas found a way to be on top. Pretty good measuring stick of a, of a really good team. Moving forward, though, talking about, some more overview of these guys. And, guys, something I wanted to kind of highlight here. We put this in our tweet when we were talking about some of the best Division II stadiums in the country. Uh, Carney Smith, I, b- I believe is what it's called, Carney Smith Field for the Gorillas, certainly has to be in that conversation. Take a look at this. This it's place badass. is unreal. Yeah, like, a really impressive setup. And on top of that, guys, I had said before, like, when they have games here, like, this place, not only does it look <laughs> Awesome. Like, this place is packed. There's their indoor facility right oh, there. Wow. So, nice little look at that. Holy, Holy cow. Shit, dude. Talk about facilities. Yeah. Team meeting room there. More like a full-ass auditorium. That is incredible. Looks like brand new. Yeah, I did not know. Oh, and just in case you guys wanted, there's a close-up on the seats to make sure that's real leather right there. I don't know why we punched in like that. A little bit of the weight room action. Part of this team feature series, I just wanted to go through and show off some of these facilities because I know a lot of people... Um, who maybe aren't even you know familiar with the D two level, especially not with these teams. This is the locker room. They have a really large That's locker sweet. room. Got some NFL. I'm gonna go back there a little bit. Got some uh, NFL alum there on the walls. It looks like I wanted to take a, a little Former bit of a closer gorillas. look at that. Yes, right there. Pretty sweet stuff. Moving to the rest of the locker room, though, you can see the size of that thing. Like that is huge. Which is really sweet. So some really great facilities at Pittsburgh State, and part of that is too, like when you have the success that you have uh, as a program, those are the type of things that are going to come to you, and you continue to win 
there is going to continue to be upgrades and other things to your facilities. Now, uh, we are, that was really, as far as facilities go, we got a good look at everything right there. But let's talk about some stats. Two All-Americans coming back for the Gorillas this year. One of those is Trace Jeffries. Shout out, Trace. Follows us on the, on the platform. So shout out to you, big fella. We appreciate you. He's listed at 6'4", 322. Holy cow. He was an All-American last year on the offensive line. And that offensive line unit is going to be a very big point of improvement from an outsider's perspective here for the Gorillas. They averaged over 130 yards per game on the ground. But something that I saw was only 3.6 yards per carry. So not a whole lot of breakout runs. It seemed like a lot of nitty-gritty between the tackles. They're a very physical team on both sides of the line, uh, line of scrimmage. And you've got three new transfers coming up front. Zane Madison from West Texas a and a D2 transfer. you got Aiden Chance from Western Illinois, which I believe is NAIA, correct? Western Illinois? Sorry, no. That's the, that's the Bulldogs, the Leathernecks. Yeah. That's D1. I'm thinking Illinois Wesleyan, my bad. Uh, Western Illinois. And then you have Landon Blobaugh from Northwestern State. So three big transfers coming in. And when guys come in like that, they're not coming in to sit the bench, right? They're coming in to be starters. What would that be like, Trevor, to have two guys and then all of a sudden here's three new transplants, boom, Right away, now you have a whole entirely new offensive line unit because the other guy I was looking at here was their honorable mention, All-American, uh, who played interior O-line. He is leaving. So Trace, I believe, is one of the only returners coming back on that front. I think it's kind of huge, too, to have plug-and-play starters on the offensive line that can be good day one Yeah, because the offensive line is such a, like, position that you, there's a lot of development involved. Like, it's hard to – you very rarely find a um, – an offensive lineman that freshman year it can just start right away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can get athletes that, that if they're just that adapt. good, yeah, they can, they can adapt. grow into a yeah. role. Yep. But it takes time to develop as an offensive lineman, so that's huge to be able to bring in three guys to start right away. Yeah. And that, again, we don't well, we don't know, but but we're we, under the assumption if you're bringing in three transfers, they're there to start. Exactly. You don't bring in guys to sit the bench like that. And you know, I'm sure there are a couple other really talented starters in that offensive front that are coming back. I just that's not something you usually see like right away is like, again, I'm not sitting down doing hours of film studying these guys. If I had the time, I would, but I don't. But I'm sure there are other pieces. But again, this is all from an outsider's perspective. That seems to be a big point uh, of improvement potentially for them. And then right behind the offensive line, what position is most impacted? You could say quarterback, but I'm going along the lines of running back, right? We had seen losing the starting running back for them. Caleb Lewis, he's going to Tarleton State. Ran for 1,000 yards last year. And I know you had said they definitely split that load a decent amount between a few yeah. backs. There was like... It doesn't... like, But at the end of the day, when you have that many carries and you have that kind of volume, because we know 3.6 yards per carry, he's not busting off these incredible... No. You know, at, I'm not every single time, obviously, but 1,000 yards is going to be hard to produce. He had like the grand majority of all the carries, and there was like three guys behind him that had about 40 carries on the year. Yeah. So I think it'll just be interesting to see who will get the bulk of that load this year because clearly they, yeah. they like to run the ball a lot. Yeah. And, I mean, that too, especially in those first couple games when you have an unsure – maybe they maybe they do have a sure number one and they feel really good about one guy right now. But when you go into those first couple games, we could certainly see a split load from yeah. this gorilla backfield. And that could be something that um, continues throughout the season if they like the dynamic of that, especially if you have two backs with a kind of widely separated skill sets. Or maybe you see them as the games go on, really dive into one guy and really commit – to him being the bell cow, I guess, so to speak, right? Uh, another guy, I forgot to mention, Devon Garrison, tight end. He was an All-American last year. 35 receptions, 614 yards, seven touchdowns. So I certainly wouldn't say lighting up the stat book, but this guy was a big-time red zone threat for them. And when they get into scoring position, it kind of felt like you knew where the ball was going. And as a tight ends, as far as tight ends go at the D2 level, something that's not as utilized, I think, as the larger levels of college football, if you guys would agree with me there. I know in the NFL yeah. we've seen tight ends become this absolute unicorn of a position that mm -hmm. just trickled down to Division One a little bit because we have guys wanting to make that kind of generational wealth in the NFL. But at the D2 level, we don't see as many tight ends that are these – unicorns so well, i think a lot of it too is a grand majority of the best division two football is in like the midwest region like yeah. even pittsburgh state i mm -hmm. think that's still the midwest i, I i'm not sure but, but it, basically generally, it, generally yeah essentially yeah. so it's like still the traditional we want to run the ball have your true tight end that blocks a lot yes. and then also a real yeah. inline tight end yes yeah. classic why yeah exactly yep. yeah i think that's a good point now um another piece 
on this Pittsburgh State team. They got a new defense, a new co-defensive coordinator, I should say, and corners coach, Devontae Sims. He comes over from Angelo State, who's at number five in those preseason rankings. Angelo State, they had a year last year. They go eleven and one, make a, a decent run into the playoffs. And then while at ASU, though, Devontae Sims, why I wanted to talk about him, they ranked top five nationally in scoring defense. They were number four. Passing yards allowed, they were number four in the country. In total defense, they were number one. In interceptions, they were number one. And yeah. in defensive passing efficiency, they were number two. And they got a new D coordinator? No, this is that's the D coordinator, the, co- the co-defensive coordinator. He was the corners coach over there. Oh, okay. He's okay, the okay. one coming to Pittsburgh State, and he's bringing with him the crew. You would imagine there's probably some guys falling over. Not sure 100% on that, but when you have someone coming from a defense who produced every single one of those statistics last year with his corners being a huge part of that. I mean, they led the country in interceptions and total defense and almost in defensive pass. It's like I get tired saying all of it. It's It's absurd. So I felt like that was definitely worth mentioning. That's a big pickup for them. And, you know, when you talk about getting new coordinators and having to go through a new scheme and things, doesn't seem to be the case as he is the co-defensive coordinator. So you'd assume there is an incumbent there that – they are probably maintaining that same scheme because last time I checked, when you go, what did I say, like twelve and one? Yeah. Uh, usually you don't change a whole lot of scheme. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Usually you kind of keep the status quo and keep going. But Cade, you had saw earlier potentially, <clears throat> potentially emphasis on potentially, little bit of a quarterback composition for Pitt State heading into uh, fall camp between the returner, Chad Dotson Jr., and then Darius Bowers, the transfer yeah, from so, Central Arkansas. So I was just kind of looking at it more as we're sitting here, but. It says in his bio that he transferred um, over the summer from University of Central Arkansas, um, and it says he's going to look for the challenge uh, for action under, under center this fall. He spent three seasons uh, at UCA. He didn't appear in many. Uh, he completed 10 of 20 passes for 135 yards and a touchdown. Um, he's a great high school player. Um, his name is Darius Bowers. He's a junior. I know, uh, I believe it was it Chad Dodson Jr. got the majority of the uh, – Looks last year, yeah. I believe he had. He a, ran for. I mean, he threw for like three thousand yards. He, yeah, he twenty nine um, tutties. Pretty good year. Yeah, he had a good year. Um, it'll be interesting to see. I'm not sure. Uh, what those like, like? Like I said, I don't. I'm not sitting down and evaluating quarterback film, but like. Yeah, we're just taking what we know. What I know. I out know there. that like quarterback, like competition room in the quarterbacks, the biggest. I think like it's the biggest, uh, like plus to a team's. Totally. Potential. It's and always good to have at the start of the season, of like going into camp. Like Dotson will be their number one going to camp. Well, yeah, he's the proven, right? But like, it'll be good to see. You know what I mean? Like, just see what happens. That's always about, a good position to have a plethora of yeah. like good, anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. We talk about that with the running backs a lot, especially with the nature of the position is very different yeah. than the quarterback. But with the quarterbacks, having someone there to compete against every day and elevate your game. Yeah. Or you pull Zach Wilson and make their life hell every single day. <laughs> yeah. Which Aaron actually said he has not made his life hell. He's been very pleasant to work with. So Zach was a liar. They seem like they're boys now. <laughs> they definitely are. But we can take a look. I want to look at their uh, 2023 schedule, Pitt State, before we move on to our Division Three team that we're going to talk about. And, fellas, moving through this, like, the biggest thing that stands out to me is that it's not nearly as front-loaded as their 2022 schedule is. No shots taken at Washburn, at Fort Hayes State, at Central Missouri. Um, Central Missouri Mules. especially has had uh, a solid program here this last decade or so, to my knowledge. But those teams are not the ones that we've talked about them having extremely close games with. Now, when you get to Nebraska Kearney here, Emporia State, Northwest Missouri, even a Sioux Falls potentially, now you're talking about some games that are going to be very interesting. But this first portion of the schedule right here, from my perspective, you expect Pitt State to roll. Roll yeah. right into this thing. Then they've got actually a pretty good setup where Nebraska Kearney, that's going to be a competitive one. Then you go Northeastern State, yeah, Emporia State, boom, back. And then you get kind of, uh, these are no by no means off weeks. There are still good competition. Yeah. I don't want to, but what I do want to say is those ones that you know, what no matter how much coach speak comes out of that program over there, down there in Pittsburgh, you know this one and this one, and you can't see my mouse on the screen. I just realized, but you guys can. <laughs> you know those ones are marked up on the calendar. Yeah. And really, when you get to this point, that's game what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like game eight, Northwest yeah. Missouri right here. That game is going to have a very large 
It's a very thing, easy thing to say. That's going to have very large implications on this conference, oh, yeah, man, my double A. And to see what kind of season Emporia State and Kearney have, right, that's going to be very interesting because mm-hmm. they certainly could be dark horse contenders in this conference. But when you get to that Week 8 moment right here at Northwest Missouri, that's going to say a lot about where these teams game. are at. And that's why I feel good about Pittsburgh State is that in those games, they have a very good track record of coming out on top, even in the away games. They're at Northwest Missouri this year. Not take anything away from those Bearcats because they have certainly given a lot of really competitive teams, Ferris included, they've given them games in the past, and they have been just right there. They have not been able to claim that championship in uh, a few years here, but they have been certainly successful. They close out the year with Missouri Western and Central Oklahoma, and then uh, wherever the playoffs takes them. But that was pretty good, fellas. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I think people will appreciate that too because that's – just like a little bit more in depth than they would probably get. We kind of aggregate all the news, put it together, and then present it in a way that's easy to easy to take in. Yeah.